So I will start off. I am Chris Gunter. I met y'all last week. I'm the senior advisor to the director here at NHGRI. And um, I think this is a great talk to follow on from last week. I should say I'm filling in for Larry Brody, who had to go out of town. Um, so last week, we talked about genome annotation and how we figure out what a gene is and how we look at different versions of the genome. Um, and and mark landmarks, for example, uh, and, and literally annotate that. Um, and that is all very important to lead into what our today's speaker is going to talk about, which is then how do we know, once we know where genes are, how do we know what variants are different between people and what their uh, effects might be? So I'm going to introduce him. Dr. Douglas Fowler has three academic positions at the University of Washington. He's a professor of genome sciences, an adjunct professor of bioengineering, and a member of the Brotman Beatty. I hope I said that right. Is it Beatty or Batty? Beatty. Beatty. Okay. Institute for Precision Medicine. Um, and he's going to tell you a lot more about what he's doing, but we also know him as a co-director of the Center for Actionable Variant Analysis, which is what we're going to hear about today, and then a founder and current executive committee member of the Atlas of Variant Effects Alliance, which I think is a great, um, a great organization. So, Doug, I'm going to turn it over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Chris, for that kind introduction. Um, I'm excited to speak with all of you today. I was talking with Chris um, ahead of the uh, of, of the hour that if people have questions in the chat, um, it's fine to you know for Chris to break in and and um, ask clarifying questions. In particular, if I say something that doesn't make sense or people want a you know a different discussion or definition, um, please just ask me. Um, you know that's a, a an advantage of everyone being virtual. You're all in front of your keyboards today, so um, it's also really exciting to prepare this talk, um, you're not often asked to kind of give a very broad talk on a huge slice of of of, uh, of a field. And so it was a lot of fun um, for me to go back and think about, um, think about, you know, uh, uh, the work that I do and what what is its historical context and what is sort of the big picture. So I'm hoping to tell you today about, as Chris said, how we know whether genetic variants have an effect or don't have an effect. But before I do that, I was asked um, or given the opportunity to tell you a little bit about how I got into science and decided that I wanted to become a scientist. And I think those are actually two different uh, questions. Um, you know, so I got excited about science um, by, uh, uh, as a kid, dreaming about and thinking about um, space science and cosmology. And these are some of the images from that era. Um, these are some of the images from that era. And I, I really wanted to be an astronaut. Um, I, I knew that I loved, you know, thinking about what could be out there and how the universe came to be and all of these kind of big questions. But I didn't, I didn't, there's no, nobody in my family is a scientist. So I had no framework for what it would actually mean to be a science scientist or do science. No understanding of that at all. I just knew that I was in love with um, something science adjacent and, and, and loved thinking about it. Um, so that, you know, led me uh, eventually to go to Northwestern University for my undergrad, where I, I studied chemistry and physics and, um, you know, wasn't actually initially interested in biology at all. But um, then I took this incredible biochemistry class and learned about um, photosynthesis. And uh, I don't know if any of you have ever you know, taking biochemistry, I learned about um, learned about photosynthesis and in particular the enzymes that that do photosynthesis, photosystem one and two. But um, it turns out that these enzymes um, have made great use of quantum mechanics, which I was also taking as a chemist at the time, um, to sort of optimize electron transfer, uh, electron transfer. You know, after the photons are harvested. Um, and uh, that that electron transfer efficiency actually approaches like the physical limit of what uh, uh, of how you know of how efficient the process could be and, and and involves all kinds of cool quantum mechanics. And in in reading about it, you know, and thinking about like why you know, this is incredible, like how could this enzyme be so amazing? Um, you know, I, I started really thinking about, you know, okay, of course I learned about evolution, but really thinking about what an incredibly powerful force selection is that, you know, if given even a tiny toehold over millions and billions of years, like you'll end up with this incredible enzyme that can take light and convert it into chemical energy with near, you know, near optimal efficiency. And so that was sort of this first, you know, this first um, moment where I was like, oh man, genetics is cool. Uh, and then uh, around the same time, you know, the, 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 the uh, in initial draft of the human genome 
sequence was published. And, you know, I have to admit that this, this science paper uh, describing it came with a big poster that you could unfold. And I, I had it on the wall of my apartment uh, when I was in college. And I, 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 I didn't think of myself as a geneticist at that time. I was still finishing a, a BA in chemistry, but it was just incredible to look at this scientific achievement that seemed so big and at the same time, you know, so, um, like took the coordination of so many people. It, it just really changed my view of what science could be, um, what science could be. So uh, based on all that, I decided to uh, go to the Scripps Research Institute and become, uh, uh, and do a PhD in chemistry. And that, that PhD was really focused largely on, uh, on proteins and understanding um, a particular type of protein uh, that, that can form an aggregate called an amyloid aggregate. It doesn't really matter, but what I got to do, and this is, I'm shamelessly showing you a figure from one of my papers in grad school, but the, the reason I want to show it is because you can see in this pretty picture, you know, the organelle that I studied, which is, uh, which is called the melanosome. I'm going to switch to the laser pointer here, the melanosome, and it, it serves to synthesize um, all the melanin, all the pigment in our skin and eyes. And you can see it sort of develops with these fibers that get the pigment deposited on them. And um, the reason why I'm telling you this is that I learned what it meant to actually be a scientist and fell in love with the doing of science by doing this project because I hypothesized that what the function of these fibers were, which was to bind this molecule you see here and like uh, 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 mediate the polymerization of this molecule. And the reason, the way I was able to figure it out um, also made me fall in love with genetics because it turns out that if you um, have a variant that disrupts the formation of these protein fibers, then what happens um, is that you end up as an albino. So you don't make any pigment. And in thinking about it, I realized that this molecule is, is a really toxic molecule. And so I hypothesized that, you know, this fiber could soak up this molecule and keep it from leaking out of the of this organelle. But if there was no fiber, then the molecule would leak out and the uh, would kill the cells. And in fact, that's what happened. So I, I, I sort of spent a bit of my PhD reading about the genetics of coat color and albinism, which is really fascinating and cool. Um, and, and I think was what one of the things that really made me fall in love with, uh, really made me fall in love with genetics, but also taught me what it meant to be a scientist. And uh, that I just found totally captivating. So this was the moment when I knew, yeah, I want to be a scientist. I want to do this. I want to keep thinking about and and uh, discovering discovering things um, using the scientific method. method. So um, based on all these little hints that genetics and genomics was the right way to go. And, uh, you know, I decided to do a postdoc with uh, Stan Fields, who's a yeast geneticist and technologist at the University of Washington. And um, what I gained there was really kind of the second big piece, you know, so learning how to frame a hypothesis and 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 um, gather evidence, you know, that, that was sort of, okay, I mechanistically, I understand how to be a scientist and I like doing it. The second big piece though, was finding creativity in, in, in science, because, uh, my opinion is that that really good scientists are creative, not just sort of mechanistic in following a, a workflow. And um, that's what I was able to do uh, in, 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 in my postdoc. And the thing that really catalyzed my creativity was the, the high throughput DNA sequencing revolution. So I'm sure you've all seen this very famous and amazing plot um, from NHGRI, which just tracks the cost of sequencing over time. And I started my postdoc like right around when the cost of sequencing was just plummeting uh, dramatically. And um, that was, of course, because of the invention of, of high throughput DNA sequencing and its deployment. And what exploded out of that technological innovation was all kinds of work. Yes, sequencing exomes and genomes and, you know, getting us to today, um, but also functional genomics, like what happened in the ENCODE project. And in, uh, in, in an indirect way, you know, uh, genome editing, because we were able to discover the, the, the sequences of the enzymes that, you know, that what went on to be used. Anyway, um, what all of this did was help me see that there was this, th this through line from, you know, Fred Sanger's invention of sequencing by synthesis through to contemporary genomics. And so in addition to falling in love with um, some of the stuff I'll tell you about um, in the next hour, I also fell in love with technology and technology development because, and I'm sure many of you have seen this type of cartoon before, right, that you can only look where there's light. So if you're searching for your keys and you're looking under the lamppost, you might not find them because you probably lost them where there wasn't any light, but you can't look where there's no light. Um, 
you know, what I, what I, what I came to appreciate was that by building technologies that can let us measure things that we haven't been able to measure before, um, we can shine light on areas uh, of, of inquiry that were previously, um, previously dark to us and thus inaccessible. And so that's what I've really dedicated my, um, my career to. Um, and that it's, it's been uh, super satisfying and fun. So that's, um, that's how I got to be a, a PI at the University of Washington. Um, and I started my lab really focusing on technology development and understanding uh, uh, what variants do. But it took me, you know, one, once I had started my, my PI job, I started working with clinicians and um, you know, medical geneticists and genetic counselors and, and really came to understand the importance of, of inter interpreting variants in the human genome, not, not just the sort of gee whiz uh, biological importance, but the, the real clinical problem. Um, and so that's what we're going to uh, spend a bit of time uh, talking about. And I understand that there's, a, there's an, an off book session where you can ask me questions uh, after the camera stop rolling about all my career and, and whatever else you want to ask. And I would love to take whatever questions you want um, at the end there. Okay. So let's talk about uh, genetic variation. So um, I'm gonna I'm gonna purposely keep the definition of a variant a little bit vague because, as many of you probably know, variants in the genome come in all shapes and sizes. So a lot of what I'm gonna talk about is gonna be focused on single nucleotide variants, so single letter changes, um, and those are the variants that we know the most about because those are the kinds of variants that, until very recently, our sequencing te sequencing technology was really optimized to detect. But of course, there's there are all kinds of variants, right? Ranging from single letter changes to, you know, uh, somewhat larger insertions and deletions to wholesale, you know, large uh, alterations of chromosomes, and all of those are very important. And um, many of the things I'm going to say will apply to all of them, and some of the things I'm going to say will apply really much more just to single nucleotide variants. But I think the first thing to appreciate is there are all kinds of variants. So um, the next thing to appreciate is that there are a huge number of variants in the human genome, right? So there's 3 billion base pairs uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a haploid copy of, of the genome. And, uh, you know, I got interested in understanding the, the question or answering the question, just how many of those variants would we encounter if we could sequence everybody, uh, um, uh, sorry, in, that, in those 3 billion bases, there are 9 billion possible single letter changes. Uh, single letter variants. And I got interested in answering the question, like how many of those variants would we find if we sequenced everyone on the planet? And um, the answer turns out to be pretty easy to at least put a bound on because we know that the human mutation rate is about one nucleotide per 100 million, or sorry, one mutation per 100 million nucleotides per generation. And if you just do the math, that means that each one of us harbors on, the av on average 60 de novo variants. And um, since there are 8 billion people alive today, that means there's 50 instances of every possible single nucleotide variant. And many others, geneticists and others, have done this calculation before me, so it's not a new thing. But when I did it early in my faculty career, it totally blew my mind. And I realized that if we're thinking about understanding genetic variants, we have to think about not just the ones that we've already observed, but in fact, more or less every single one of them, uh, because eventually we'll encounter them all. And this, so the scale of this problem, even just for single nucleotide variants, which are in some sense the simplest kind to understand, is massive. And once you add in um, all those larger and more complex types of variation, uh, the, the, the problem like really explodes in complexity. So how do we know what variants do? Well, like any good, <laughs> like any good uh, talk on, uh, oops, my slides are frozen, on biology, we're going to start with the central dogma. Right, so if we find a variant in the genome, um, there's a chance it will occur in a coding region, and if it occurs in a coding region, then we know uh, something about what that variant's going to do almost by definition, right? Because we have a co grammar in the coding region, right? So we know that um, genes are organized into introns and exons, and if the variant occurs in an exon, we know that there's a, a, a triplet code that specifies how the variant will change the polypeptide sequence or won't, depending on what type of, of single letter DNA variant it is. And so we have a grammar that in theory can tell us exactly what's going on with uh, variants in the in the in, in coding regions of the genome and in fact will tell us what will happen uh, on the polypeptide level. 
However, oh, and so what that means is that some types of variants, like stop gain variants. So if you if you if you have a a, a gene, right, a coding region of a gene, and um, a nucleotide variant causes, uh, say, the second position, the second codon to be uh, um, to be instead of some amino acid, a, a stop codon, then you can be pretty sure that that variant is going to interrupt the function of that gene. Uh, and so those variants are pretty easy to interpret. Same goes more or less for stop loss variants and variants that alter splicing at the sort of core conserved um, uh, uh, regions of uh, exon intron junctions that are important for splicing. However, the sidewalk of easy to interpret variants using the, the central dogma runs out very quickly. So missense variants that change an amino acid sequence are extremely challenging to interpret because, well, we'll talk about that in a minute. And then of course, there's the vast like universe of non-coding variants, right? Where not only, um, you know, we've, we're sort of only just recently arrived at the point where we even know where the important regions of the non-coding genome are and have some sense of what those regions do, um, but we're still very much um, lost when we try to understand what variants in those non-coding regions do in general. So, so although we have the central dogma and that helps us out, in practice, most variants in the genome are hard to uh, understand or hard to predict. It's hard to predict what they do. And that's because once we get past the polypeptide level and talk about how an amino acid variant, a missense variant, impacts protein folding or function, or how a non-coding or coding variant impacts, say, um, cell differentiation or during development or cell function in an adult organism, or uh, even more complex, how a variant will impact an, an, a, you know, uh, 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 an adult and their and their phenotype. Um, we really have big problems uh, and and can't make accurate predictions in many in many cases. So that's why the problem is hard. That's why understanding genetic variation is a, is a hard problem. Um, and why it's far from a solved problem. So how does all that, um, how does all that uh, uh, roll up to the clinic? Well, um, you may have heard, right, that um, you may have heard a little bit about uh, uh, what clinicians do to interpret genetic variants. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get there in this talk. Well, I'll give you like the sort of um, research scientist view of what happens in the clinic uh, later. But right now, I just wanna tell you that Clinicians try to interpret variants into one of five categories, um, two are benign and two are uh, pathogenic, those categories. And then there's this variant of uncertain significance category. And that's what happens when a clinician, uh, as the result of a genetic test or an exome or genome sequence, finds a variant, uh, finds a variant in, a, in, a, in or near a gene that's linked to disease and tries to interpret that variant by gathering all the information they can. And I'll tell you about what sorts of information are used for this process in the clinic, but tries to gather all the information they can and ends up with an insufficient amount of information to say whether the variant is pathogenic or benign. So variants of uncertain significance represent a dead end, right? They represent an inability to use a genetic test result that could be meaningful to diagnose or guide the treatment of disease. And you can see that in ClinVar, which is the database that holds- Oh, you didn't, okay. Um, Somebody's unmuted. Are you asking a question? No, I'm going to infer. Okay. Um, uh, so anyway, uh, variants of uncertain significance represent a, almost 90% of the variants uh, in the ClinVar database, which are you know, the database that holds clinically interpreted variants, and they're, they're sort of exploding over time. And that's because we're really good at sequencing genomes and doing genetic tests, but we still are not that good at interpreting uh, uh, what those variants do. So that's where the problem kind of meets um, a practical, the problem of variant interpretation meets a real practical um, challenge. Okay. So that sets up our discussion of, of, uh, of, of the problem. And what I want to do is basically now tell you in, in a very brief uh, 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 terms or introduce you to the sort of four main ways that um, we can learn about what variants do. And these four main ways uh, of, of learning about what variants do draw on kind of different, um, different parts of our knowledge about the genome and about biology. Um, and what you'll see is that uh, they, they add up to, uh, or, well, what you'll see, what I hope you understand when we're, when we're done with this section is kind of how uh, people have started to use this information and it'll get us to kind of where we are today.
um, with each one of these types of information. So I'm just going to kind of go through each one of them and try to introduce you to the different ways that we can learn about uh, variant, uh, variant, uh, variance in their effects. Okay, so the first one is by analyzing how a variant uh, uh, segregates, that is either um, segregates in a family. And so many of you have probably seen uh, a visualization like this. This is a represent, representation of a particular family and um, it's called a, a pedigree. And each uh, a box, cir circle or box in this pedigree is a, in, is a person in the family. And the, 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 um, the box or circle is shaded in, in this study according to the person's uh, cholesterol levels. So dark uh, circles or boxes indicate a person with very high cholesterol levels. And there's other information in this in this pedigree. So this this pedigree is from a, a very famous paper that um, from uh, Goldstein and, and Matulski and went, the work of Goldstein went on. He went on to get a Nobel Prize for it, but basically, but for figuring out that this disease related phenotype, high cholesterol, segregated in this family in in a in a in a fashion that basically indicated, that it was a Mendelian trait, right? That is that there was like one gene and variants in one gene that were responsible, one or a few genes, that were responsible for this, um, this, uh, uh, this segregation pattern. And so that was kind of the first thing that happened, right? Was that people realized that diseases and disease-related phenotypes can be inherited in a monogenic or Mendelian, in, in a monogenic or Mendelian fashion. And, and that uh, means that there in in a family there's there's going to be like one variant that underlies uh, this this uh, this pattern and the inheritance of that one variant is going to determine whether you have high cholesterol or don't have high cholesterol. That was the inference that was made. Now, of course, at this point, it was it was it wasn't it was you know not possible to find the gene and find the variant, um, but that technology for that came and you've I, I gather you've heard about that. Uh, a little bit in this in this in this series before, so I want to skip forward to one of the very early, I think maybe the first, um, the first that I could find anyway, example where um, a group analyzed a pedigree in the context of a particular uh, variant, or in this case type case type of variant, and were able to use the use the pedigree, use the segregation of the variant to basically say, hey, this is the pathogenic variant that's causing this phenotype. So this was in the context of Huntington, Huntington's disease, which is a degener neurodegenerative disease. And we now know that it's a, what's called a repeat expansion disease. So there's a, in, the, in, the, in the gene that's responsible, there's a, a triplet repeat, and it can expand to many, many copies. And if you have a, a large number of copies, uh, is particularly over a certain threshold of copies, you get the disease. And if you have the smaller number of copies, you don't. And so again, affected individuals are shown with darkened triangles here. And um, I'm sorry for the low quality. This is what you could get off the cell website for this old paper. But what you can see is a PCR, a gel of a PCR. And so the bigger bands represent more copies of this repeat. And what the authors want you to notice is that the individuals with the with the uh, uh, with the phenotype with Huntington's disease have larger copies of this of this uh, repeat. So these repeats are expanded, and so this uh, they concluded based on the on on this data that the repeat expansion was the was this that this type of variant was the responsible variant for uh, Huntington's disease in this family. And so this hopefully illustrates to you how you can use the analysis of um, uh, families and whether uh, a phenotype you're interested in, so a disease or whatever, segregates with a particular variant that is always co-occurs with a particular variant or doesn't to learn about whether that variant, um, uh, whether that variant is, is uh, uh, pathogenic or benign. Okay, so that's a brief introduction to segregation. It's one of the gold standard methods for learning about what variants do. Um, the next thing I want to talk about is evolution, in particular, what's called comparative genomics, where we where we compare the sequence of uh, of, of a gene or region of the genome in uh, across many species and analyze how that sequence has changed over evolutionary time to infer what variants do. And so, the idea for uh, comparative genomics and uh, and understanding variants using um, evolution comes from the, this idea that, that Darwin, uh, you know, illustrated, which is a species tree. So he sketched a species tree. So every leaf in this or no, uh, terminal node in this tree is a different species. And the species are arranged in this, in this sketch uh, by their relatedness, right? So the closer you are in the tree, the more related you are. Now, of course, Darwin didn't have genome sequences. So in his 
in his uh, sketched species tree, these, these would be um, arranged by phenotype proximity. So how, so how similar do these species look? But of, cat, of course, now we can make a species tree using, uh, using genome sequences instead. And once we have a bunch of sequences from different species for a genome, uh, for, for a region of the genome, like a gene that we're interested in, we can do, make what's called a multiple sequence alignment. And that's what I'm gonna show you here. So what a multiple sequence alignment is, is where you stack up uh, the sequence of the of the gene and try to match up each position that is conserved across all the uh, all the different uh, species. So what I'm showing you here is um, a snippet of a gene, and you can see the amino acid sequence of this of this uh, the, the the protein that's encoded by this gene in in cows. And so you get the the single letter um, amino acid codes here. And and this oops is this is the alignment of that of that sequence to the human sequence. And what you'll notice is that the letters are all the same. So uh, or, uh, are all the same so that the cow sequence and the human sequence match exactly. And we can stack up sequences from lots and lots of other species that go, you know, across uh, hundreds of millions of years of evolution. And what we can do then is analyze how the um, amino acid that is at e each position is either conserved across evolution or not. And so I want you to notice this lysine here, this K, um, that is absolutely conserved uh, across, across uh, evolution, right? So every one of our species has this same amino acid at this position. And what I hope you'll notice and what, what people inferred about this type of conservation is, wow, this lysine must be doing something really important if across all of evolutionary time, it hasn't changed at all. But then there are other positions where there is some conservation, like at this position where there's a phenylalanine in, in the cow, you can see that there are other like type, sim so similar substitutions. So to, in this case, to um, hydrophobic amino acids like isoleucine or valine, but you never see a charged amino acid like arginine or lysine. Um, and so this position is partially conserved. And then there are other positions uh, that vary completely. And we would infer that those positions where you can sort of swap out the amino acid that you see in cows and humans to any other amino acid are not so functionally important. And so, oops, I went back. Uh, and so, and so, uh, this was, the, people use this information to interpret variants in, in, the, in the genome, right? Because if you find a variant at a conserved position like this lysine, then you would infer, hey, that variant is going to disrupt the function of this protein and be pathogenic. Whereas, um, whereas if you find a variant at a position that just varies freely across, across species, you might infer, okay, that variant is much less likely to be disruptive because it works, you know, uh, many, many different amino acids work at that position. So people uh, turned this type of multiple sequence alignment into what's called a variant effect predictor, which is a computational algorithm that analyzes the conservation at each position and between positions now, actually, and um, makes a prediction about what the variant, uh, what, what a particular variant you're interested in does based on the principle I just told you about. And this is um, output from one of the very first variant effect predictors uh, called sorting intolerant from tolerant or SIFT. And you can see that what you could do is query this predictor for a particular substitution. And the predictor would say, okay, I went and analyzed the multiple sequence alignment. And I can tell you with some probability that the variant you're interested in affects the protein function or does not affect the protein function. And so this is the idea of using evolutionary um, comparative genomics to infer or predict the effect of a variant based on conservation uh, across a multiple sequence alignment. Okay, so the third um, way we can learn about variants and what they do is by analyzing not different sequences of a particular region of the genome across evolution, so many species, but analyzing analyzing uh, the the uh, that se the, the sequences we find in a large population of humans or other organisms, but we're talking about humans here. So. Um, and so there, the basic idea, and so, so there's there's been a, you know a, a ton of interesting stuff that's happened in this space in the last fifteen years. This is just a a, a figure from a, a paper that described an early database called Exac, and it was it, it had something like fifty thousand exomes in it. And one thing that um, the the authors were able to do with this at the time incredible data resource was just analyze how frequently. Uh, did different types of variants occur? And what they observed was that there were a very small number of, of variants that occurred in large 
percentage of the people that were that were sequenced, so like 10% or 1%. So these are common variants, right? And then there was a huge number of, there were a huge number of variants that were rare, so rare, many of them, that they only were observed once in this, in this set of 50,000 or so people. And this is an outcome, we'll talk more about rare, rare variants and common variants and why there are so many rare variants later in the talk, but um, but, but suffice to say, this, this has held true. You, the more people you sequence, the more rare variants you find, and you find comparatively few common variants. And what people knew and, 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 and inferred was that, uh, knew and then used to infer about variants, is that if a variant is common in, in, the, in a population, then it pretty much can't be a deleterious variant. And, and selection and evolution pretty much guarantees that, right? Because if a variant has a deleterious effect on fitness, then it will be purged from the population um, by the forces of selection. And so any variant that we see at high frequency, we can infer with a pretty reasonable, um, with a pretty reasonable uh, uh, probability is, is not going to be pathogenic. It's not going to be deleterious. It is instead going to be benign. Now there are, that is a generalization and you could have a whole nother 90 minute session about the genetics of common variants. And there are lots of interesting cases where variants can be a little bit, um, a little bit deleterious and still be common. But in general, if you see a variant at high frequency in a population, and in particular, if that variant is in a gene and you know what the disease frequency, the frequency of the disease linked to that gene is, um, and, and the variant is higher than the frequency of the disease in the population, then you can be pretty sure that that variant does not cause that disease. Because um, if the disease incidence, let's say, is 1%, and the variant that you're interested in occurs in 10% of people, uh, then that variant cannot cause the disease because the incidence is only 1%. So anyway, that's the idea of by sequencing large populations, um, we, can, we, can, we can identify uh, in particular uh, benign variants, variants that are not deleterious based on their frequency. And we'll come back to, to, to um, some of the really exciting stuff happening with population sequencing later, but that's the idea of population sequencing. Okay, so the uh, last thing I wanna talk about are experiments and um, uh, the basic idea of an experiment, uh, an experimental assay of a variant is that um, you use some model system. So that could be doing biochemistry, like um, studying proteins, or using cell lines and using genome editing, or using model organism genetics, like a mouse or a fly or whatever. And you uh, make a wild type version of your fly or mouse or uh, cell line and also a variant version, right? So you edit the genome or produce the variant protein, and then you compare those two in a set of experiments, right? So if you had a mouse model of say diabetes, right? And you were interested in a variant that you hypothesize might cause diabetes, you could make the variant mouse and then ask whether it reproduced the phenotype of a known pathogenic variant. And if it did, you would infer, oh, this variant might also cause diabetes. And if it didn't, if it looked instead like the wild type or reference sequence, then you might infer, oh, hey, this variant is actually a, a normal function variant and doesn't, doesn't cause diabetes. So that's the idea of, uh, ex of, of experiments. And um, just like all these other lines of evidence, there's actually a rich tradition of using this type of assay, uh, the, of this type of uh, evidence to understand or information to understand variants. So this is just an old paper that was one of the first I could find that really um, tested genetic variants um, using model systems. And they did two types of assays on BRCA1, which is a gene we'll come back to, but that's a gene where um, germline variants of BRCA1, uh, loss of function variants um, can cause, uh, cause an, a greatly increased risk of breast and other cancers. And so BRCA1 can activate gene expression. That's a process called transactivation. And uh, so these authors constructed a transactivation assay. So testing how well BRCA1 variants activated gene expression, both in yeast, and you can see their, their, their sort of reference or wild type control here in open squares, and then some variants uh, in, in these closed um, circles and triangles. And these variants don't transactivate uh, in yeast. And they also did an experiment in cultured human cells and showed once again that compared to the reference or wild type, uh, the variants they were interested in didn't transactivate, um, didn't, weren't able to activate gene expression. So they inferred, hey, these variants must be pathogenic because they don't fulfill this critical function of this gene. So that's the idea of using an experiment to test variant effects. So I've just told you about these incredible, you know, this, this summarizes like many decades of work incredible work by you know thousands of scientists around the world and that 
all that work has rolled up to, and I'll talk more about experiments later. Anyway, all that work has rolled up to an incredible set of data about variants, right? I talked about the ENCODE project and what it has added. There's NOMAD, which is the database that holds, one of the databases that holds um, allele frequencies from now hundreds of thousands of genomes. MAVEDB is a database we run with lots of experimental variant effects. There are projects like the NHGRI's Impact of Genomic Variation on Function Consortium that are trying to um, measure variant effects and predict variant effects at scale. There's biobanks like all of us. We'll talk about that later. There's variant data everywhere. So how can it be that we're in this circumstance where we don't aren't able to interpret most variants that we find in the clinic? Well, in order to answer that question, I have to tell you a little bit about how clinicians interpret variants um, uh, that they find in human genomes. And it turns out that they use the exactly the four sources of information that I told you about. So segregation, evolution, but in the form of variant effect predictors, so computational tools that make predictions, those predictions are mostly based on evolutionary conservation and more. We'll talk about that in the second part. Population frequency. So I told you about how we can find, uh, you know, if, if variants are common in the population, they're much less likely to be pathogenic. So, you know, population frequency and experiments. Clinicians also take into account the patient phenotype, right? So in other words, if, if there's um, a person with a BRCA1 variant, and they have early onset breast cancer, that's evidence that that variant is, 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 is pathogenic. So those are the pieces of information that clinicians use. Why don't they have enough information? Well, I'm gonna step through each one of these and give my impression, and I'm not a clinician, and someone hopefully else in this series will give you a, a real deal talk on clinical genetics. I'm just gonna summarize. But, um, but with segregation, right? Segregation, as I said, it's a gold standard uh, method, but segregation is hard to enact at scale in, in real clinical populations because it requires testing many family members. So the person who has the variant that went to the clinical geneticist now has to go to their mom and their dad and their brothers and their sisters and their aunts and their uncles and their cousins and say, hey, I need you to take a genetic test to figure out whether the variant that I have is pathogenic or benign. And that's First of all, that's impossible for some people because they're not connected to that big of a family. It's hard for many others to have that conversation and there's resistance you know, to genetic testing. Again, that's another talk. And also it's expensive and insurance companies don't necessarily wanna pay for it. So segregation is amazing, but not often available to us. Population frequency can be informative, but as I said, most variants in the genome are rare and rare variants don't tend to inform, uh, don't inform our population, our inference of pathogenicity. Like if you find a variant that is only occurred in one or two people, what does that mean? Well, it doesn't mean that it's pathogenic, but it certainly can't be used as evidence that it's benign either. So population frequency is great when you have it, but often you don't. Patient phenotypes sometimes are very clear, sometimes they're not. Again, I'm not a clinician, but it just suffice to say that patient phenotype is not always um, clear or available. Um, Predictor evidence, so variant effect predictions from evolution are uh, usually available, that's a beautiful thing about them, but they're often, they only often provide weak evidence, so, and we'll talk about, um, we'll, we'll talk about more about that in the second half. And then experimental data, as much progress as we've made, are, are, are often missing. We only have experimental variant effect data for something like 1% of the disease-related genes in the genome at this moment. So it's great if you have it. All of these sites of evidence, except for variant effect predictions, pretty much fall into the, it's great if you have it and can clearly use it, but often you don't. And that's how we get to here, where although we can sequence people and do genetic tests at scale, it's very hard for us to interpret variants definitively. Um, Okay, so that's what I wanted to say about, uh, that's what I wanted to say about, uh, uh, by way of introduction to variant uh, uh, interpretation. So hopefully you've learned that there are four main lines of evidence um, that, that uh, people use to, or that we can use to understand variant effects, you know, coming from segregation, coming from evolution, coming from sequencing populations and coming from doing experiments. Um, and I give you try to give you just a little bit of a flavor of what clin clinical geneticists do when they try to um, interpret a variant in uh, in a human genome. So now um, it's question and answer time, and I'd be pleased to take your questions. Woohoo! And I will just say that we have fifty one people on, which is more than we normally have. So maybe the internet outage and remote calling in is actually working for us, and also because you're so popular. Um, uh, so, uh, does anyone have questions that they'd like to ask Doug? You can either put it in the chat and I'll read it, or, um, it'd be great if you want to raise your hand and we'll make sure that everyone can see you. Yeah, go ahead, Reagan. Yeah. 
Yeah, thank you so much for a very nice presentation. Yeah, so my, my question was, uh, uh, could, could you comment on the frequencies that, um, because uh, in terms of determining what is a SNP, uh, I, what I know, understand is you need to consider the frequency in the population. And sometimes uh, it, the frequency uh, definition for the frequency you, you uh, to be used it, it differs, and sometimes you use one percent, sometimes it's zero point. Yeah, the it changes. What I know, there are different definitions. So, uh, if you could comment on the frequencies and how you come about with that. Yeah, I'll I'll do my. Thank you so much for the question. It's a great question. I'll do my best. Um, uh, the the. I, th I think that trying to draw an arbitrary line and say, well, this is what common means and this is what rare means isn't, my opinion is that that's not actually a super useful exercise. Like people did do that, right? And say like, okay, if it's above 1%, that means common. So that means it's 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 gonna be benign uh, or maybe it's 0.1%. But the fact of the matter is it, it, it if you're trying to interpret the variant relative to disease, then it actually gets back to what I was trying to say and probably just garbled and said very quickly, which is that the variance frequency has to be considered in the context of the disease's rarity in the population, right? So if you have, so suppose you have a variant that's at 1% in the population, right? And that variant is linked to a gene that is causes an incredibly rare disease. Like let's say that disease only occurs in 0.0001% of the population, like it's a very rare disease. Well, and let's say that disease has a phenotype you can't miss, like it's, you know, it causes some something that any, any clinician would find. Then you can infer with total clarity, hey, that 1% variant, it can't be pathogenic because, because the disease is only a 0.001% frequency, right? On the flip side, if you had a, another variant at 1%, but now in a gene that was linked to a common disease, right? You, you would say at 10% in the population, you couldn't make that same inference because now a 1% variant frequency could in fact cause, be, be a, you know, a, a pathogenic variant for a disease that was at 10%. And so we're going to get into, in the second part of the talk to the way that people are using variant, variant frequency in the light of disease and disease frequency to do what are called case control studies and try to um, and try to use variant frequency in a more nuanced way. But it's a great it's a great question, and hopefully I've done an, I've tried to take a stab at answering it. It's I'm I'm not a population geneticist, so uh, but hopefully that gives you a flavor of 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 the answer. Yeah, thank you. Um, and then I think Mike Lopez had your hand up. I don't know if you want to ask your question. Hi, yeah, I did have a question, but you actually through that answering that last question exactly answered my question. I was just really hoping to further elaborate on how genes considered pathogenic. And I was gonna I was gonna ask you about your earlier example where you mentioned the 10% of the population, 1% of the population, 0.001% of the population, but just right there, that was perfect. Okay. Well done. Uh thanks, Mike and Reagan. And then you have one in the chat, which is shouldn't penetrance factor into allele frequency thresholds. If a disease uh, uh, percent penetrance with 1% incidence, then a variant with 10% frequency can presumably still be causative. That is absolutely true. So for those who don't know, um, penetrance is this idea that, um, so for so some variants uh, in some genes are simple in the sense that the if the person has the variant, any person in any context, then they will also get the disease or have the phenotype. That's what's called a completely penetrant variant. However, what we've learned recently is that most variants in most genes are not completely penetrant. So in other words, I might have the variant and get the disease, but you might have the same variant in the same gene and not get the disease. And there are lots of reasons why that can be the case. Um, one reason is genetic context, right? So I might have a variant that interacts with that variant to, to give me the disease and you might not have that other variant and so you don't. It might have to do with environmental context. Like maybe that variant primes you to be sensitive to an environmental exposure that then causes the disease. But if the ex environmental exposure doesn't happen, you don't get the disease. So that's the idea of penetrance. And it's absolutely true that when you do uh, the kind of analysis that I talked about, you, you do have to take 
penetrance into account because if of if if genes if variants in in that gene tend to be lowly penetrant that is only one percent of the time and only one percent of people do they cause the disease then um then you know you have to consider that when you're making your argument about whether a variant is pathogenic or or benign based on the disease frequency and that is an that is not my expertise that's an active area of research i'll touch on a paper that sort of gets at this idea, but there's a whole, I mean, it's a whole burgeoning field. And I, I commend you for asking the question and commend you, I recommend to you that you go read, uh, maybe read the paper that I'm gonna talk about, which will have a little bit about that. And then there's like a whole, there's there's a really, it, you can email me and I'll send you my favorite paper on that topic if, if you want. It, it opens okay, up. cool. Yeah, yeah. Or you can send it to, to Susan and she can send it around as well. Right. Yeah. I'll do that. Great. Um, yeah, I think that's a great question. And I, as you're saying, the problem is you don't know what the penetrance is, right? So it can become slightly chicken and egg in the argument because how do, how do we know what the penetrance is? So I think that's, that's really important. to. And we talked about this last week that one of the best things about genomics is that every time you think you have an answer to stuff, it actually opens up more questions. So I feel like this is a perfect example of that is that, okay, we found a variant. Oh, but wait, penetrance might be an issue. So yeah, that's, that's a different question. So yep. Yeah, no, it is a beautiful thing about genomics and science generally, right? You 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 peel away layers of the onion, but the onion never goes away. It's always exactly. there. <laughs> it is exactly <laughs> the layers, exactly. Um, okay, I don't see any other questions. So maybe we should go ahead into the second part. And again, if people have questions, they can put them in the chat and I can stop Doug if needed and he can clarify um, or we can come to them at the end. So second part. Great. Thank you both or all three so, uh, so much for your questions. Um, so... Uh, this part of the talk uh, is going to be a little bit more broad ranging. I'm going to basically, what I'm going to do is start from, you know, hopefully now you understand that if we want to interpret more variants in the genome, we have to have more information, right? We're missing information uh, from, from, from most variants. And that's why we end up with so many variants of uncertain significance um, uh, on the clinical side and why we are so often stumped about the biology of variants uh, as well. So what we're going to do is talk about how we can get more information about about variants, and um, I'm going to make one simplifying uh, statement here, which is not completely true, but it's partially true. That um, understanding that measuring uh, or or uh, quantifying uh, segregation of a variant into pedigree and uh, getting patient phenotype data are inherently less scalable types of of information. I talked about some of the reasons why. Um, doing uh, analysis of large pedigrees is is can be costly and and um, there are additional problems with it. And then you know on the patient phenotype side, um, we'll talk a little bit about how that's improving with biobanks. But um, you know it it's it's uh, it's a really hard problem, and I think we're you know it's a really hard problem. So I think these are inherently less scalable types of information, though lots of smart people are working on them. And they could come and give other 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 talks uh, about about how they're trying to scale up these types of, uh, of of information. What I would like to do is spend the time talking about what are, in my view, more inherently, or maybe I should say, um, uh, types of data that are 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 being scaled right now, um, so that we will have more information from populations uh, and population sequencing from um, variant effect predictions, uh, evolution, and also protein structure, which we'll talk about, and uh, experiments. So I'm gonna sort of confine my talk to these areas. And if there's time at the end, I will also include um, just a little bit of <clears throat> unpublished data from my own lab as a, a fun thing to talk about. But if we don't get to it, that's also totally fine. Um, it's a little bit indulgent. So uh, if we don't get there, that's uh, all good. Um, and what I hope to do is, is convince you, or at least illustrate for you, how um, there, there is lots more information coming to interpret variants, and that I think we will be in a very different place uh, five years from now than we are today. Okay. So what I'm going to do, sorry, what I'm going to do is spend a couple slides on population frequency and sequencing populations, and a couple slides on variant effect predictions. And then um, because it's my research area, I'll spend uh, a bit more time on um, functional assays and uh, experiments. Okay, so what's happening with sequencing populations? Well, a lot. It's a very exciting time. And if I were going to go do a postdoc, I might choose to work 
on uh, analyzing biobank information because it's it's really just incredible. So what is a biobank? So a biobank is uh, is a repository, uh, often set up by a research study, sometimes set up by health systems, um, uh, sometimes set up by 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 health systems like um, insurance companies or big um, hospital systems or the like. Um, and it seeks to warehouse information about uh, patients and individuals, both you know patients in the system that are healthy, patients in the system that are not healthy. Um, and the, the types of information that biobanks collect is really diverse. It's estimated that there were 50 million biobank enrollees across the globe in 2020. Now compare that to our exact paper that I told you about before, the exome sequencing paper, which didn't have any phenotype information. That was just the exome sequences. So there was no medical record. There was no phenotype data really for those people. Compare that 50,000 to 50 million in 2020. Um, now, most of the people of those 50 million people in those biobanks don't have genome sequences or genetic information, right? The biobank might just be collecting, you know, um, cells or some other you know artifact for people to analyze um, but there are in the last uh, years the rise of these very large biobanks and the NIH is all of us uh, program is emblematic of these biobanks that are seeking to collect a sort of deep stack of information on a large number of people so what do I mean by that well all of us is targeting a million individuals for inclusion in the biobank there are about 250,000 that have been um, sequenced so far the biobank also includes includes phenotype data, right? So, and different people in the biobank are phenotyped to different levels, but at least some bio, uh, some phenotype information has been gathered. Um, and for some people, there's electronic health records. So not just phenotype information, but medical records that can be analyzed to understand that person's medical history. Um, and so, uh, hopefully what you can get from this is that there are two big advances relative to exact, right? One, just many more people. So if we want to estimate allele frequency, we can now do it. And, and by the way, all of us is just one. There are biobanks in the UK and, and many other places that are similar in size. And so there's a huge pile of information now, many more sequences, many more people, which means our ability to estimate allele frequency um, gets much, much better in the for rare alleles, right? Instead of being able to go to a frequency of one in 50,000, which is what you would do with exact, you can go to a frequency of one in millions. And also these biobanks are being built in a much more you know, uh, equitable and diverse way. So we can begin to think about variants in specific populations, um, which, is, which is also very good. The other big advance here is that these biobanks come with phenotype information. So instead of just looking at allele frequency, we can look at phenotype as well. And so um, I want to just briefly highlight this, uh, in my opinion, like really incredible and cool um, study that that just came out. It's a it's a um, uh, still on on archive. Um, so it's a preprint, and this study um, is was interested in trying to use allele frequency information along with phenotype information, along with a phenotype information to make inferences about or interpret variants in breast cancer related genes. So BRCA1 and a few other genes. Um, and so what they did was do something called a case control study. So they had a hundred people who had breast cancer, hundred thousand people who had breast cancer and 300,000 unaffected controls. And what they did was basically look at the allele frequency, the frequency of each variant in the cases and in the controls. So you could imagine computing a ratio, right, of cases to controls. Um, so if, if, that, if that ratio is roughly one, right, that is to say that, the, uh, that in cases, the, the variant is about, found about as many, uh, about as frequently in, in cases as it is in controls, then you might infer that that variant doesn't have an effect on, uh, on breast cancer risk. However, if that variant is found in say 10 or 100 times uh, at a 10 or 100 times higher frequency in cases than it is in controls, then you might say, wow, that variant uh, is likely to be pathogenic. Whereas if the inverse is true, it's found, um, sorry, I don't wanna say that. Uh, you might infer that that variant is, is, uh, is, is likely to be pathogenic. And so this um, Senke plot is basically showing you in these 400,000 individuals, they, they found about a thousand variants that were um, that were uh, un variants of uncertain significance, so unclassified. And most of them are missense variants. Uh, and what they were able to do by doing this case control analysis was provide evidence for uh, these variants being benign, 
uh, many of these variants being benign and a few of them being pathogenic. But um, the main thing I want you to take away is that by having a big pile of, of sequenced individuals and their phenotypes, you can do a case control study that allows you to provide evidence for interpretation of lots of variants as mostly as benign and a few as, as, as pathogenic. And this is really a big evolution and it gets to the questioner's question, uh, the first questioner's question really nicely, right? A big evolution from our thinking um, you know, many years ago where we were just asking ourselves, okay, is this variant frequent, is this variant at high frequency? If yes, it's probably benign. And so, so this is a big evolution in our thinking, and it's and it's and it's enabled by biobanks, and um, and and so uh, I, I recommend checking this paper out. Okay, so let's talk about let's talk about variant effect predictors and evolution. Here too, there's been um, some exciting progress. Uh, some exciting progress. This is a figure from a paper called um, uh, that describes a tool called Alpha Missense. So it's from Google's DeepMind, and it builds on their very famous and now um, Nobel Prize winning um, AlphaFold uh, model. And it's it, it, the heart of AlphaFold and AlphaMissense is the exact same idea that I introduced to you with SIFT. At the heart of that model uh, is uh, a multiple sequence alignment, really. So an analysis, uh, a comparative analysis of, of, uh, of sequences across um, many organisms. Additionally, the thing that, that was added, not just in alpha missense, but in protein uh, variant effect predictors uh, going back over a decade, was protein structure context. So if you have a variant in a protein and that variant occurs on the surface of the protein, it's much more likely that that variant is not going to disrupt the function of the protein. Whereas if it occurs in the core of the protein, the folded core, uh, uh, packed core of the protein, it's much more likely that that variant will be disruptive to the protein's function. And what AlphaFold was able to do was provide accurate structure predictions for many, many most human proteins. Whereas before we only had the structures that we'd solved with, only had high quality structures that we'd solved with experimental methods like X-ray crystallography or uh, NMR or cryo-EM. And so what AlphaMissense did was basically bring together all these high quality predicted structures with a very sophisticated and clever what's called protein language model, which is a way to use a neural network to ingest and represent that, that multiple sequence alignment that takes, in, ad in addition to taking into account the variation at a particular position, like we talked about in the first part, a protein language model takes into account variation uh, the co-occurrences of variation at different positions and some other features that turn out to be very informative. And so, and so uh, predictive models like alpha missense are, have increased uh, the accuracy of predictors by a fair bit. So this is a, a paper from another, uh, a figure from another paper from um, the, the Marx lab describing a tool called Eve, which is um, uh, similar to um, uh, similar to alpha missense in that it uses a very complex neural network uh, to represent evolutionary information and is kind of one of these next generation models. And what I want you to pay attention to, so each dot in this plot is a different predictor. So people have been making predictors for decades, there's lots of them. What I want you to pay attention to is this x-axis, which is the accuracy, you can think of it basically as the accuracy of the predictor on ClinVar pathogenic and benign variants. So gold standard control pathogenic and benign. So higher is better. And what you can see, I think, First thing that's remarkable is SIFT, the humble tool, 1993, that I told you about, actually does pretty well. It's roughly 87% accurate in predicting uh, 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 clinical variant effects. EVE is much better. It's 92% accurate or so. And the other thing I wanted to tell you is these filled in circles are what are called unsupervised models. And I don't know how many of you know about, about AI and machine learning, but when we train an AI model, we often use example uh, example or labeled or control, uh, in this case, variants. So we might train our model on ClinVar pathogenic and ClinVar benign variants. And when we do that, um, we create a situation where it's then difficult to fairly evaluate the performance of the predictor, right? Because you used a lot of, of labeled variants that are labeled in the same way that you're trying to predict. And also, um, the model can become circular, which is to say that it kind of learns the particular um, the particular uh, properties of the control variants that you use to train the model, but isn't very good at making general predictions, uh, making general predictions. And um, 
and so I don't want to go too far into that. Again, that's a whole other talk, AI and genomics, um, uh, uh, that I hope you all uh, are, are able to watch. Um, but the point is that the development of unsupervised models that don't use control variants to train um, has made these models much less circular and much easier to evaluate uh, in terms of their performance. And EVE is one such model, and actually SIFT is also one such model. Um, and so for those two reasons, uh, the, 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 the advent of better methods of, of, of representing um, evolutionary information in neural networks, the inclusion of high quality protein structures, and the um, elimination of circularity, variant effect predictors are more accurate and easier and to evaluate fairly. And as a consequence, they have recently uh, begun to play a much bigger role in clinical variant inter interpretation. Okay, so um, that's what I wanted to say about populations and, uh, 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 and, and biobanks and variant effect predictors. So I'm going to turn my attention now to uh, I'm going to turn my attention now to uh, variant effect measurements. So experiments. So um, the big news here in the last decade or so is what are called multiplexed. Uh, uh, assays of variant effect, or said another way, experiments that can test many variants simultaneously. And the way these experiments work, uh, I'll illustrate the way these experiments work uh, in, in a simple way. So um, suppose we start with a human cell line, cultured human cell line, and you want to measure the effect of variants in BRCA1, let's say, which is a gene that is, because it's critical for DNA repair, it's critical for cell growth. It's an essential gene. So if you knock out BRCA1, cells don't grow. So um, what we have learned how to do is basically take uh, uh, cells and edit them so that every cell expresses a different variant. So each cell expresses one and only one variant of, of in this case, BRCA1, but collectively, all the cells in the dish express all the possible single nucleotide variants of BRCA1. So a huge number, tens, tens of thousands of variants, right? Collectively expressed in this, in this dish. And then what we do is let the cells grow. And I told you BRCA1 is, is critical for cell survival. So if the cell expresses a variant uh, like this red one here, that is a loss of function variant, well, those cells can't grow and they drop out of the population over time. But variants like this purple one or this green one or this blue one, those are uh, normal function variants and they continue to grow. And so um, what, we, what we do is use high throughput DNA sequencing to basically uh, uh, measure the frequency of every variant at the beginning of our uh, growth selection and then at the end. And by comparing the frequency before and after, we can actually score every variant in the population with respect to its um, with respect to its ability to support the growth of these cells. And so um, that's the idea of that's the idea of using high throughput DNA sequencing to do uh, variant effect, um, measurement at scale. And we've made all kinds of different assays that, that use the same trick of starting with a pool of cells that express a whole library of variants, and then uh, rigging up some selection that we can use a high throughput DNA sequencing to read out. And so another one that we developed is for protein abundance, which turns out to be the main mechanism of pathogenicity for most um, uh, protein coding uh, variants. So uh, just to explain, that means that, you know, when a variant occurs in a protein and it's pathogenic, usually what happens is it disrupts the folding of the protein and the protein is just degraded. And so it's present at low abundance inside cells. And so what we did was make a, an assay that um, links protein abundance to uh, fluorophore, GFP. So green cells express highly abundant proteins and, and uh, uh, that is high levels of fluorescence and and uh, lowly uh, abundant cells drive low levels of fluorescence. And then we can use fluorescence activated cell sorting to sort cells out into like very low abundance, um, very low GFP, thus very low abundance bins, all the way up to like very high GFP, thus uh, normal or wild type like level of abundance bins. And then again, we use high throughput DNA sequencing to count the number of times we see each variant in every bin. And then we can compute a score um, that reflects the variant's abundance, even though, um, even though we didn't measure it using, you know, a cytometer directly, we used sequencing instead. So, um, so there's lots of different assays of this kind developed by my lab and many other labs now um, that we, so we have this huge kind of um, uh, first generation of tools that can measure variant effects at scale. So what do you get if you apply one of these assays? Well, you get something that looks like this. So I'm showing you here a variant effect map 
for a protein coding region of, uh, of, of the genome. And every column in this map is a different amino acid substitution, or sorry, a different position in the gene. Every row is a different substitution, so a different amino acid. And the um, map is colored from uh, red, which means like total loss of function or abnormal function, through to blue, which means normal function, wild type like function. So once we have this kind of map, um, what we can do is basically uh, is basically ask, okay, does does the variant that we're interested in can this map provide evidence for a variant that we're interested in? And what we might do is say, okay, I'm interested in this variant at position 77, and I see, oh, it's a really uh, it has a normal abundance, it has a wild type like abundance. So that's evidence can be some evidence that this variant is benign. Contrarily, this variant at position 71, if we saw that in a patient, we might say, oh, that's a low abundance variant, it's abnormal. Um, and that might provide some evidence that the variant is pathogenic. Um, so, uh, so that's the idea of multiplex assays of variant effect. Um, this, this type of map would encompass all of the possible single letter variants in the entire gene. So a really nice advantage of this map is that we can use it to interpret all the variants that we've already seen, the ones that are already in ClinVar that are variants of uncertain significance, but we can also go back to this map every time we find a new variant in a genome. So it, like a, like a predictive model, like a variant effect predictor, it can allow us to have data ready to go when we find a variant in the clinic. Okay, so um, we did a study. Uh, we did a study where we basically asked, okay, we've generated a bunch of this variant effect data, and I'm just showing you some maps here to remind you this data is at the scale of all the variants in the gene um, for three genes: BRCA1, we've talked about TP53 and P10, or other genes where germline variants caused increased risk of cancer. And all of these genes have a lot of variants of uncertain significance in them. And uh, all of these genes, in all of these genes, having an interpretation that is knowing if a variant you carry is pathogenic or benign can, um, you know, that can provide a more accurate diagnosis and in some cases be used to guide treatment. So it's really important to know about variants of uncertain significance and what they do in these genes. And what we were able to do um, was basically reanalyze a bunch of variants of uncertain significance in these genes using the variant effect data, the functional measurements, the experiments that had been done. And what we showed was that having the data allowed us to reinterpret, you know, somewhere between 70%, as many as 70% of the variance of uncertain significance in TP53, and even for P10, 15%, right? So we can really change the landscape of variant interpretation just by having this one type of experimental data. Uh, so uh, this was a pretty exciting result because it means that now we have a type of functional genomics data, variant effect measurements, that we can generate at scale and that can really help us solve this clinical problem uh, 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 that we have. Of course, also, I'm not telling you here because I don't have time about all the amazing biology that we also learned about um, with, with how these variants uh, disrupt function and, and, and so on and so forth. Um, subsequent to, to our study, um, several, many, this is now out of date too, but many other studies have been published that have gone after other genes and shown really conclusively that, uh, that variant effect data is uh, a very useful type of data to have when you are trying to um, uh, classify variants and eliminate variants of uncertain significance. Okay. So, like I said, we run this database called MAVEDB, um, uh, which is supported, and I'll talk about this in a minute, by a couple of different NHGRI programs. Um, this database has grown uh, enormously over the past uh, number of years and now holds almost uh, 8 million variant effect measurements um, across a large number of genes. Now, not all these genes are human genes, and not all the human genes that are in there are, um, are clinically relevant genes, because people use this variant effect mapping technology to like do protein design and understand protein structure function and understand how cells regulate signaling pathways and all kinds of things. But the bottom line is we have really pretty high quality variant effect maps for about 40, a little over 40 genes uh, in the human genome that are, that are clinically important. And that works out to about 1% of the 4,500 genes or so that have been linked in some way to uh, disease. So we have I, I would, what I would argue is kind of a pilot uh, uh, scale set of, of data. And as I just showed you, we know that it's very useful. But we have 99% to go. So what's next? Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about um, the research program that, uh, that, that uh, I lead. 
uh, at the University of Washington, along with many other folks who I will mention at the end. Um, one of those uh, programs is the Center for the Multiplex Assessment of Phenotype, which is an NHGRI um, Center of Excellence in Genome Sciences. And the goal of this center is to develop a uh, new technology to measure variant effects, um, particularly in the genetic cell and developmental context that uh, is needed to capture their effect. And this gets back to the um, third questioner's question about penetrance, right? Because everything I've told you about up to this point with variant effects, and in fact, many of the lines of evidence we've talked about has been in what I would term sort of um, genetics easy mode, like BRCA1, where variants are highly penetrant, right? Um, and they tend to cause the same phenotype in, in, in everyone who carries them. But of course, as we already talked about, that's not the case in, uh, for, for many genes and, and many variants. And so we need to, technologies that can capture uh, these different contexts to be able to account for uh, 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 co complications like penetrance. And then as uh, Chris already mentioned, um, I, along with my colleague, Leah Starita, lead the Center for Actionable Variant Analysis, which is a part of the IGBF consortium. And our goal here is to measure about 200,000 variant effects in about 30 clinically actionable genes, which uh, you know would roughly double the number of genes we have uh, data for, um, and then use the results to eliminate variants of uncertain significance, just like I told you about. So that's kind of an overview of what we're up to. Um, I, as I said, I'm gonna take um, just a few minutes and tell you about an unpublished research project because um, it's 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 interesting and cool, and hopefully you'll find it cool too, at least some of you will. Um, and it involves a gene that's one of my favorite genes in the genome because it's just so fascinating. And that gene is called lamin A. And lamin A is a gene that encodes a protein that, um, forms the primary proteinaceous component of the nuclear envelope. It's connected to um, chromosomes. And in fact, uh, Jason Bonrostro just had an incredible paper that I commend to you using uh, uh, the same type of technology I'm going to talk about in situ sequencing to study um, how the genome itself, like parts of the genome, move around inside the nucleus uh, and make contact with laminae and how that changes as cells age and other stuff. Anyway, it's an amazing paper. But the point is laminae is a cool gene that uh, encodes a protein that um, defines the morphology and function of the nuclear envelope. And variants of laminae can cause a bunch of different diseases. Um, and uh, one of the phenotypes that you see if you look at patient uh, cells is this phenotype here. So um, laminae is tagged with GFP, and you can see in this pathogenic variant, it makes these kind of foci, it aggregates, it seems. Whereas in wild uh, wild type cells, it's, it's kind of nice and evenly distributed across the nuclear envelope like we would expect. And so um, laminae, variants in laminae can cause heart disease, but also uh, a type of heart disease called muscular, uh, sorry, called cardiomyopathy, but also muscular dystrophy, a different fat wasting disease called lipodystrophy, and an really interesting premature aging syndrome called progeria. And so one of the things that my lab is really interested in is like, how can this variance in this one gene cause these four different diseases? And does that have anything to do with the um, way that la the laminate protein functions in the, in the, in the nucleus, uh, functions in the nucleus? And so with all that in hand, we decided to develop a technology for, um, for uh, uh, measuring how variants in laminae and other genes impact that visual phenotype, that's that nuclear um, uh, 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 phenotype that we can see by imaging with a microscope. And so we had to develop a method uh, which we call variant in situ sequencing that allows us to express um, variants inside uh, um, cultured human cells uh, and then later uh, basically discover the sequence of each variant using the microscope as a sequencer. And that the core of this technology, like I said, is called in situ sequencing. And that was developed by George Church and others um, quite a while ago now. And so what we've been able to do is, um, is uh, uh, build upon that technology to be able to measure variant effects at scale in laminate. And I'm just showing you an image here of our cells expressing uh, different uh, variants of laminate. So again, this is a, a, a set of cells that collectively express all the variants uh, in a region of this protein, uh, all the possible single letter variants, but each cell expresses one and only one variant. And you can see like some cells like this one have a sort of phenotype where there are some aggregates. Other cells have a phenotype where there are lots of aggregates. You know, some cells look like there uh, is no expression at all, like this cell here, the laminate protein is just absent in green. Um, 
So you see lots of phenotypes. And we were able to, um, like I said, sequence those cells using the microscope as a sequencer. And these are just dots showing you like almost what you would see on an alumina flow cell. So each dot is a different, um, is a different piece of uh, RNA that has been reverse transcribed and then amplified many times. So it's es essentially a, a clonal amplification of a single molecule of a barcode that tells us which variant is in each cell. Um, uh, and so uh, the bottom line is we can know using this method which cells express which variants, and then we can analyze um, we can analyze the cell images, the phenotype images, along with the sequence uh, the sequencing of each cell to to uh, tell us how um, how laminae modifies or alters that that uh, nuclear uh, that nuclear envelope, its structure, its shape, and what we see. Uh, in the cells, and so what we did that um, we did that using another type of neural network called a vision transformer. And I really don't have time to tell you all uh, or, or, or much about what uh, what we did there, but I do want to just show you this one cool um, uh, figure, which is uh, so. This is many of you have probably seen this before. This is a, a UMAP representation, but basically to make this representation, what we did is we took all the cell images we had. We fed them into a neural network that embeds or reduces the dimensions of those of those images to like a one vector that kind of captures the uh, difference or the distance between each cell's image and all the other cells' images. And what you're seeing is a plot of those distances. So the further each each um, point here is a variant, and the further the variant is from another variant in this in this uh, representation, the more different their images are. So the more different they look. And what you can see is that the synonymous variants, right, which don't change the protein sequence and thus don't have an effect on the cells, occupy this kind of restricted space, this arc of restricted space in the UMAP, whereas all the missense variants spread out across a much bigger space. And in fact, what we've learned in subsequent analyses is that variants in sort of this lobe of the UMAP uh, of, of this representation are pathogenic variants that have one particular uh, cellular phenotype and variants up here are pathogenic variants that have a different uh, um, uh, 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 phenotype. And so uh, it's been really fun to analyze the data. But the bottom line is, um, this is just one example of a technology that we're um, getting at, that, that we're developing to dissect variant effects um, and try to understand, in this case, the mapping between um, one gene and many different uh, diseases with the hypothesis that variants of these you know, that cause these different diseases will have different cellular phenotypes. And we're not there yet. I don't have an answer, but um, but uh, um, I just wanted to kind of give you a flavor of the sort of research that's that's going on in this space right now. Okay, so the vision, um, the vision uh, uh, that we have is to collect variant effect data. So these kind of variant effect maps that are comprehensive representations or measurements of the effect of every possible variant in a gene to collect such data for every gene in the genome, or at least all the disease-associated genes in the genome and their attendant regulatory elements. Um, uh, so, you know, promoters, enhancers, um, uh, introns and the like. Um, and to do that, not just for one layer of phenotype, like cell growth, but for many layers of phenotype, you know, for, um, uh, uh, you know, transcription and, and transcriptional regulation, for um, protein um, abundance and activity, for you know, cell morphology and um, behavior, and that if we did that right, we would we would really have a sort of complete description or a much more complete description of how variants act on the molecular level and on the cellular level to produce human phenotypes. And incidentally, as I've already showed you, this type of data um, will be hugely helpful in interpreting variant effects. Um, lastly, I want to say if any of that like piqued your interest. Um, as I said, uh, uh, we have a couple of NHGRI efforts at the University of Washington that are focused on the, on the idea. Um, we also run an organization called the Alice of Arian Effects, which um, is an international organization uh, focused on creating such an, an atlas of variant effects. Um, you can access data at MAVEDB. The data will soon appear, we hope, in um, ClinVar and a few other places, but you can get the data right now at MAVEDB. Um, there's an annual meeting that we run um, that uh, is going to be in um, Spain this year that has a couple hundred people at it that are, you know, if you're interested, you could come and attend. And then there's also a trainee-led um, seminar series called the Variant Effects Seminar Series um, that features, you know, early career scientists um, that, that are interested in understanding variant effects. It focuses, I would say, um, 
principally on experimental approaches, but not exclusively. Um, and so also contains, you know, people using biobanks and um, doing some of the other types of analyses that I talked about. So um, that's something that you can check out if you want. I want to thank a bunch of people um, in helping me prepare this talk and also to, uh, uh, doing the work that I showed you from my lab, in particular, Leah Starita, who's a very close friend and collaborator, um, Ambry Genetics, a, a company that we worked with to do the variant reinterpretation work, which was led by um, Sean Fair and then Sriram Pandyala, um, who, along with Katie Partington and others, uh, especially Nick Bradley, uh, did the um, variant in situ sequencing work that I told you about. Um, so that's all I wanted to say about kind of where things are going now. And I have um, some references uh, uh, for everyone to look at here, but I guess I'm gonna stop the share because we're done with slides. Thanks so much for paying attention. I know this is a long one, but um, I really enjoyed talking about it. So hopefully um, it was valuable for you too. Yeah, thank you. And I, um, you, you uh, I think, got into a number of uh, points that just prove what we were talking about earlier. Do you think you've solved one thing and then it, it, the other things come up? I mean, I can attest to that. We did a big uh, project in my lab where we looked at um, doing a genome-wide association study for variants for social behavior, atypical to social behaviors in macaques, actually. And then came up with variants that, like, I believe the GWAS, they seem to actually be related to these behaviors, and they're almost all missense variants. So mm -hmm. what do they do? We don't know. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Although I noticed that there were some papers that just came out in the last month or two that talked about how um, you, uh, showing that there are effects from missense variants in different ways. So I'm looking forward to reading into those and getting mm -hmm. into those. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, questions for Doug? I, I, while people are getting their questions ready, I want to say, and I can read Reagan's in a question in a second, but I want to say this just really reflects huge amounts of work. So I appreciate you summarizing it so ably. So Reagan asked, um, very exciting work for multiplex analyses that you explained. How does the in vivo environment affect generalizability? I think maybe, I don't know if you mean in vitro environment, generalizability in vivo, especially clinical environments that have a huge environment, excuse me, phenotypes that have a huge environment component. The thinking is that in vitro systems may not replicate gene environment interaction in which a risk factor of the environment is not present. Yeah. I mean, that's a great question. Um, there's sort of two ways to answer that question. So, uh, well, I mean, one, of course, any, any model system that you do, any experiment you do is going to be imperfect, right? Um, there are imperfections. Um, and, you know, you, you list one, type of imperfection, which is that the model system may not recapitulate some important factor. It could be an environmental factor, but it could also be a genetic factor um, or a tissue or developmental factor. Um, and so we want to be able to build, um, we want to be able to build experiments that that recapitulate um, all the factors that we think are important to explain the variation that we see in, in, in humans, right? And uh, there are a couple of ways of thinking about that. So one, I think, is you need to use controls. That's a, a, a great way to make sure that your experiment is going to tell you something useful. And so many of the genes that we're interested in now do have some controls, right? They have pathogenic and benign variants that are in ClinVar, or they have variants that we can garner by doing our own case control analysis of all of us or UK Biobank, right? And we can say, hey, we have an expectation that these variants should, you know, these, these pathogenic variants should behave abnormally in our system and these benign ones shouldn't. And if our experiment doesn't match that expectation, then it means that we're missing a factor. Like maybe it's an environmental factor like you talked about. And then, and this is sort of the subject that our, 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 our um, center of excellence is working on, then what we can do is maybe go back to the biobank and say, can we discover a factor that might modify the effect of at least a few variants in that gene. And then if we've discovered such a factor, can we incorporate that factor into our experiment? Another way to do that, so that's a way to use biobanks to, to, to find the causative modifier or factor that we're missing. Another way to do that is to just make our experiments capture context better. So I didn't tell you a bunch of work that we've done to basically move these assays into iPS-derived specialized cell types. And that you know, helps to capture cell context. Um, and you know, uh, so so anyway, I think those are the, those are, that's the way to answer that question. Know when your experiment is telling you useful information and not, and then we have some clever ways to try to bring in context that we might be missing. Mm 
And if the experiment doesn't recapitulate your controls, don't do the experiment. That's a right. <laughs> that's that's <a> problem. <laughs> exactly. That's that's a general problem. Um, so you have another question here, which is how have some of the well-established MAVES performed against known variants? What are the likelihood ratios or evidence strengths that you're getting? Yeah, I mean, that is a also a very sophisticated and great question. Let me unpack just for people who don't know what's meant by evidence strength. So I didn't go into this at all. Again, I hope someone very clinical comes and gives you a clinical variant, like clinical, you know, view of genomics from the clinic talk. But um, when a clinician uses any of the types of evidence I talked about, not only do they do they, they they use the evidence, but there's a whole framework for telling the clinician how strong that piece of evidence, how much weight that evidence should carry in deciding whether the variant is pathogenic or benign. And it can range from not very much, that's called supporting, to very strong, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the way that that evidence strength is calculated is by, for functional data, is by analyzing how well the assay did in separating known benign and known pathogenic controls. And so there are all of the assays, so in the, in the paper that I linked, FAIR et al., the one that I talked about with the three donuts, so BRCA1, TP53, and, BR, and, and P10, um, those assays performed differently well, um, all performed okay. BRCA1 assay was nearly perfect. I believe that, the, that, that, that there were literally only a handful, like a, one or two variants that, were, that the assay got wrong. Wow. For TP53, it was a little bit less good, but so for BRCA1, it, it achieved strong, I believe, in both directions, strong evidence in both directions. For TP53, I think it was strong in one direction and moderate for another. And then for BRCA1, because, or sorry, for, for P10, because the assay we did did not test, um, it, it was not able to provide any evidence for a variant being benign. And that's because of the way the assay was constructed. And it provided, I believe, moderate evidence for the variant of var variants being pathogenic. So it really depends on the assay. Um, it ranges and, and you know, um, the good news is though, that the clinical community has in place rules that allow you to incorporate, to quantify how much information an assay is giving you and incorporate that information into your variant interpretation work, regardless of whether that's a little bit of information or a lot. But I recommend you go read the, um, Fair at all paper, if you want to kind of know more about that. Yeah, that's a lot. And specifically earlier, I was referring to the lamin A case as an example where we think we know one thing and then it turns into exactly lots of different answers. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, you mentioned GWAS and I, I really, I have to say, I had a version of this talk that had like 20 minutes on GWAS. And then I concluded somebody else has to talk about GWAS because that's its whole own thing. So, you know. Um, hopefully somebody will talk about you. Stay away. Stay away, okay. Doug. Exactly. Right. <laughs> I'm sure we, I'm sure we have somebody but, who's going to talk about right. it. Um, all right. So while other people are thinking of questions, I'm going to ask you the same question that I asked Jane last week, mm -hmm. which is in the UK, they have a uh, program called Desert Island Discs, and mm -hmm. you can only take six discs with you, six albums when you're stuck on a desert island and they have to be your favorites. So I'm going to ask you about your two favorite genes, Doug, if you had to pick two. Well, would they be? And in the meantime, people should be putting questions in the chat or thinking of questions. But that's so hard. See, exactly. Um, I mean, I think I think I would pick Lamin A because for reasons I already told you about, it's just fascinating. I find the pleiotropy that that sort of pleiotropy it's it's non trivial pleiotropy, or right? it's not like all the variants from one disease are just in one part of the gene and the other. That type of pleiotropy just that is to say mapping between one gene and many diseases to be really <laughs> really fascinating. Um, and I, and I love it. And then I guess the other gene I'll pick out, I mean, okay, I won't say photosystem because that's like trivial, but the other gene I'll pick out is kind of in that vein. It's um, superoxide dismutase. It's a, oh. it's a, an, it, it encodes an enzyme, the superoxide dis dismutase enzyme that um, is another one of these like biochemical miracles. It's it, like, it is diffusion limited. So it, it, it reduces reactive oxygen species, but yeah. it does so like as fast as substrates can appear. Um, and, and again, I just, I, I, that, and that gene has a somewhat interesting evolutionary history. And so it's a, it's a, it's a fun one too. Yeah. I like those choices. That's super cool. Yeah. Mine would be FMR1 because that's what I did my PhD on and then exist. Cause that's what I did my postdoc on. Oh, exist so, is right. exist see, is I was right. going to say, that's the problem. If someone else says a gene, you're like, oh, I should have picked that I one. Know, right. right? <laughs> well, there are, there are so many great genes in the genome. That's the good thing. <laughs> uh. All right. Do we have other questions for Doug about this? This is just such a really important area of what the uh, Institute is doing and 
how we take things in the forefront. Go ahead, Reagan. Yeah, a, a quick question. Yeah, so cons uh, looking at this method of looking, it's very exciting. And um, and um, some, uh, I was very curious to know, uh, there's still some uh, variants that cannot be explained by 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 the by this method. I wonder if you could comment what are the common reasons why why these variants are, are not being ex like they're still remaining unclassified even after going through this method. You mean yeah, okay. Do you so I guess I'll answer your question in two layers just so I hopefully get it. So for specifically for assays, specifically for variant effect assays experiments, um usually the reason why variants would remain unclassified if there's data for them from an assay is that that assay didn't generate enough evidence strength to move the variant from, because just having one piece of evidence isn't necessarily enough. Like what we showed in our work was, even if you have very strong evidence, you can only move about half or maybe a little more than half of variants of uncertain significance. And that reason is that clinicians require multiple independent lines of evidence to, to classify a variant as pathogenic or benign. So just knowing what the variant does in the lab, even if that assay was very good, is not always gonna be enough. There needs to be one or even two more lines of evidence. And so for some variants, they're a VUS, but we have some evidence already. And then if we add functional data, we get to a definitive classification. And for other variants, we don't have any evidence. And if we have just functional data, even if we have strong evidence, we're not going to move that variant. And that's good. That's by design, right? Like nobody should get a diagnosis. Clinicians have decided on the basis of one type of evidence. There's some exceptions to that, but generally that's true. Um, okay. So um, so then there's then there's cases maybe, and this is maybe what you were asking about is like, well, what happens? Why do, why do the assays get it wrong sometimes? And generally the assays get it wrong um, uh, 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 for reasons, it can be for reasons related to the first question you asked, right? So it can be that the assay doesn't capture the context that's important. So, you know, hopefully your controls tell you that, but there could be some variants that behave differently than your controls and you won't know about those. Um, it could be that, um, it could be that the assay doesn't measure the mechanism by which that variant has an effect. So that, you know, that, that's um, kind of a related problem, but let's say your assay doesn't measure splicing, but the variant that you're, that, that you're, you know, trying to reinterpret is a splice variant. Um, you might, you might add the wrong type of evidence in that case. Anyway, nothing is perfect. And those are some imperfections. I don't know if that answered your question, but those are my thoughts based on what you asked. Yes. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. And then we have one more question, maybe that's coming through the Q&A, so I'll read it to you. If a variant is found through research methods to be pathogenic, how is this then brought into a clinical space? Are okay. pathogenic variants, well, hold on, there's two more parts to it. Are okay. pathogenic variants predictive of disease if someone is found to have a variant but does not yet show any phenotype changes as a result? Or would that case be likely one in which the variant does not have high penetrance? I feel like the answer is yes, yes, and yes, all the way around. Yeah, those are all great questions. Um, those are all great questions. And again, I I I hope um, I hope that a, a clinical geneticist will come and yeah. give you more nuanced answers to those. But um, so okay, so can, if you find a variant incidentally, can you return it to a patient? That's one question. So the answer, and I'm going to give my opinion, my understanding of the state of things, and then you know, um, like I said. Uh, a clinician might answer things slightly differently. So the American College of Medical Genetics is this is this governing body that, um, along with ClinGen, which is another group trying to organize how variants are interpreted, uh, organize clinicians to make rules specifically about how variants are interpreted. They kind of set the rules for what clinicians are supposed to do, what the best practices are. Now, not everybody, not every doctor follows exactly what ClinGen or testing lab follows exactly what ClinGen says. But and and what ACMG says, but what they what what they say about what are, what are called secondary findings. So those are finding incidental findings. Like let's say a person comes in with early onset breast cancer, and you do an exome, and you find a a variant that you think is pathogenic in a gene related to um, cardiomyopathy. So nothing to do with breast cancer. That's what's called a secondary finding. If if you have a secondary finding, there's a list of genes called the ACMG secondary findings list. There are about 90 of those genes where the ACMG recommends that the clinician return that result, even if it's a secondary finding. And the, the reason 
the, the way that genes get on that secondary findings list is more or less whether that finding is actionable or not. So like in the case of the, of the cardiomyopathy, they might say, uh, actually, okay, um, uh, arrhythmia is a better example. So there are types of arrhythmia that if you have a variant that, that predisposes you to this arrhythmia, you can die suddenly. And also if you have an implantable defibrillator, your life will be saved. And so the ACMG says, hey, if you find a pathogenic variant in one of those genes that's related to arrhythmia, you should return it to the patient because there's something we can do that would save the patient's life. It's a much grayer area if you find a pathogenic variant in a gene that isn't why the patient showed up and there's nothing to do about it. And that, again, another talk I hope you have in this series are the ethical and social implications of genetics and genetic testing, because that, that gets into like, would that patient want to know? How do you know if they want to know? If they didn't tell you whether they want to know, is it more ethical to return the result or not return the result? Those are all like hard questions. Uh, but anyway, the ACMG secondary findings list is the, is the one. Um, and then I guess your other questions related to, uh, mm, I don't remember them. Maybe it can... was, um, uh, are pathogenic variants predictive of disease if someone is found to have a variant but does not yet show any phenotype changes okay. as a result? Or so is that, that... difference? I mean. Yeah, so that's another one that's really challenging. So um, sometimes the answer is pretty simple. Like um, diseases can have variable onset, right? So it could be that the person is well, but they haven't developed the disease yet. However, it can also be that the variant is variably penetrant and the person will never determine the disease or develop the disease. And this is, this shows up all, I mean, you may have heard of um, like, uh, uh, I mean, anyway, this shows up all, all across genetics in the clinic, like whether that's, you know, Mendelian disease. In general, for Mendelian disease, where we are right now is that people are generally getting tested, I think, because they come to a clinic with, they already have something that has triggered genetic testing. Right, like you don't, in our medical system today, generally, you don't get genetics just as a screen, right? You get genetics because something has already happened and there's an indication. And so, you know, but, but in, a, in a screening context, right, there's gonna be all kinds of variants out there that haven't yet caused disease or won't ever. And so that's its, its whole own, again, its whole own discipline where people are talking about exactly how should we deploy genetics for screening you know, we need a higher bar to call something pathogenic if we're going to call it pathogenic in a screening context precisely because of the issue you raised. So that is, those are all excellent questions. Um, and I've given you some, maybe some reflections about them. But Yeah, thank you. And as we mentioned, there's lots of work, but there's still lots more work to be done. Absolutely. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's also to me, I think you're, you're, question and the answer are both getting also at to me one of the biggest surprises is some of the early work that was done by like daniel MacArthur's group that showed that there are lots of people who are walking around with one or both copies of deleted of genes which we would have thought before that that's not possible right we have no idea and yet people are fine right yeah. so i think yeah absolutely it's it's we're redefining as we learn more so it is really okay <laughs> i think we're gonna end the recorded part here thank you so much everybody for coming um, we really appreciate it. And thank you so much, Doug. This is such an important area and we really appreciate it. Oh, well, thank you so much. I, I really enjoyed um, talking with all of you. Yeah.